Welcome today to our event, Understanding Modern Money, with Warren Mosler and Con Michalakis. Um, if you've never attended an event before, uh, Modern Money Australia is a nationwide uh, incorporated association that is built around promoting an awareness of modern monetary theory and free educational resources. So events like today, for example. Now, I don't want to get bogged down too much in terms of how this talk will be run today, but just to let you know, We'll have a Q&A section after the talk today where you can ask Warren and Con whatever your questions are. So if you do have any questions during the talk, please put them in the Q&A section of the Zoom webinar itself. That allows us to keep track of the questions and ensure you'll actually be able to ask your question, which uh, our co-host Jane Flanagan will answer and oh, sorry, ask on your behalf. If you want to ask a live question, uh, please make sure your microphone is set up and your web camera if you want to have that functionality. And um, you have the option to raise your hand at the end, um, which will then let Jane know that you want to ask a question and we'll try and get around to it. I imagine there'll be quite a few questions today from <coughs> the uh, caliber of our guests. Um, but yes, thank you for that. Um, with that, I think I'll introduce our guests now. Um, so our first guest, for most people here, maybe doesn't require much uh, introduction, and that would be Warren Mosler. So Warren Mosler is an American economist, a leading theorist in the school of monetary theory. Um, he's worked as a financial professional uh, in Wall Street, a variety of um, businesses. Um, he's also been an innovator and an inventor, having started a car company as well. Um, very broad array of interests. Uh, our second guest is uh, Con McAlarkis, who is the uh, Chief Investment Officer at uh, Statewide Super, which is Australia's largest super fund from memory. Um, he has also had a plethora of experience in the financial sector, having worked at um, Merrill Lynch before, and uh, I think it's Fenza Investment. Um, so these are two very experienced professionals who are going to share their insights and perspectives on monumentary theory. Um, I think with that, I'll probably pass on now to Pon um, and Con and Warren can have their conversation. Just to start off the conversation itself, um, Con, um, how did you encounter monumentary theory? Oh yeah, okay, well this is, quite long-winded answer but basically if you think about my background or well, my lack of sense was trained as a mathematician and then ended up being tr uh, learning how to trade uh, back in the day and then funds management and so I, I started off at high school great Keynesian teacher by the time I finished a master's degree and did a master's degree in finance I was more modern portfolio theory as opposed to modern monetary theory by the time it got to the late 90s we had the Asian crisis and I thought it was crazy that they were imposing austerity when that was the wrong thing to do. So that was my first crisis of confidence and the whole long-term capital thing about markets being um, irrational. Then the dot-com was dot-com more like it, bubble. And so that drew me back to Keynesian or macroeconomics. Then the GFC came along. I was just moved back from New York to work here in Adelaide. And by then, anything of, you know, rational expectations, the market is right, was pretty much drained out of me and was probably what you'd describe as traditional middle-of-the-road Keynesian. Then this thing called MMT <coughs> started invading the blogosphere. And like most people who first encountered, I thought, what a load of rubbish. This is incredibly bad. And then as you kept reading on it, and luckily enough, in the last couple of years, there's a person called Stephen Howe here at Adelaide Uni. I met Stephanie Kelton earlier this year. You start reading up on the books and then the light bulb moment comes on. And when it comes on, it comes on, it's almost like the matrix. You take the pill and you see it, see the, the world, how it works. And here we are today. And that's So that's someone like me who's early on. And basically my question to start off, Warren, is, how did you develop it? How did, how did it hit your mind given, and how was your journey on that? Yeah, so uh, I've got a, fairly, a short book out called The Seven Deadly Innocent Rise of Economic Policy, and it's free online, I'm not trying to sell it. But, uh, and I sort of recounted that, but I haven't read the book in 10 years. 
So if I make any mistakes, if you read the book and you find out I've made some mistakes, let me know. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best to recount it without the book. Uh, so, okay, I, I always, I, I started off um, like yourself, us in the financial sector in first the savings bank in 1973. And then I was at, uh, I got the Bankers Trust in 1970. Oh, before that, I was, I was at, while I was at the savings bank, we were trading, I don't know how much time you want to burn up on this, but uh, the Ginny May mortgage market had just come on. And I started looking at, they were trading them between different months. And, then, and no, nobody was looking at the different months for deliveries as applying uh, interest rates. I don't know why I did, but I just have to be looking at that. So I was 24 years old or something. And so uh, if I could buy them for March and simultaneously sell them for September, they had an 8% coupon and the price drop was a quarter of a point. I would have a net yield of 5% and the CD rates were 4%. So I could make an extra percent, you know, on a calendar spread, but nobody called it that back. And, you know, I went to their board of directors of the little savings bank. Had, Five million in fixed income securities, they're really tiny. And they said, "Yeah, well, that's a good idea. Go ahead and do it." So I, I wound up putting this trade on for a million each side, which is pretty small potatoes in the street. And the um, Friday night, I get a call on my cell phone at my house, where I don't, I don't know if I have cell phone, from uh, Solomon Brothers, which was the largest trading firm in the street, and it was one of the. Uh, salesman there, you know, an institutional salesman. He says, look, we're in a sales meeting now. Could you go over again what, what you did on that Ginny May trade for us? <laughs> so um, <laughs> for some reason, I, I've always been able to kind of look at these securities and sort of see through them what was fundamentally going on behind them. So like when the Fed raised reserve requirements when I was at Bankers Trust uh, later on, that was 1976, 70. Hey, I, um, the trading manager says, well, I hope they don't just give the banks the money you know, because they raise the reserve requirements. I don't know how I knew it, but I said, well, they have to give them money because it's, uh, you know, you got a debit in your, your account at the Fed. There's only the Fed can credit the accounts. You know, what are you, what are you talking about? It's just a reserve. They have to do it. And he just mumbled, well, the money supply is too high. They should bring it back, force them to bring it back from Europe. I said, they got 300 billion euro dollars slash slash around and said like, no, they don't. It's a debit and the credit. I want, you know, on, on the uh, on the euro dollar book. You can't just rip off half the balance sheet and put it on a boat to New York or something. And he did, he just turned away. He didn't want, you know, just I, I was a new guy there or something. And so um, and my, one of my future partners, Cliff Viner, calls me, he was a head trader at Phoenix Mutual, he says, uh, you know, Morgan Stanley just had this article, Eric Kahneman, the chief economist. Same thing, I hope the Fed doesn't just give them the money. I explained it to him, and he um, calls Morgan Stanley, calls me back, and he gives me this double talk. I explained why it was double talk. He called him back again, he called me back, and he says, they retracted their statement. <laughs> <laughs> so this was 1977. It wasn't MMT, but it was just a, somehow being at Bankers, being on the money desk, I was cheating my sales and trading, and, uh, but the guys next to me were doing short-term stuff, 10-year notes, two-year notes, and, and money markets. I just picked up that this thing's just a spreadsheet with debits and credits. There's nothing particularly complicated about it. And yeah, you had all this complicated rhetoric flying around. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of um, leads to 1992, where, um, you know, the Italian bonds were paying 12% in denominated lira, and you could... Uh, you could uh, borrow lira at 10%. So you're going to make a guaranteed 2% profit. The only problem was, you know, what would happen if the bonds defaulted? So the only question was whether Italy was going to default. And so if you could come up with a reason why they weren't going to default, there was a lot of money to be made. So it was something we all kind of pre got preoccupied about what, what's going on with these Italian bonds. Well, they had floating exchange rate. And so first I looked to see, and I Best I knew, nobody ever defaulted with floating exchange rates. And I wound up calling S&P and they said, oh yeah, there've been six or eight defaults. And they showed, they sent me a list of them and they were not defaults. It was things like uh, Brazil, there was a default because the inflation was so high 
that the size of the bonds was fractions of a penny. Nobody bothered to collect them, but they called it a technical default. They said the U.S. defaulted in uh, 1934 by going off the gold standard. That was a default. So that wasn't applicable. So I was with my uh, research guy, Tom Schulke. I said, you know, look, if we buy bonds from the Treasury or if we buy bonds from the Fed, it doesn't matter to us. It's all the same thing. Okay, so we, our money goes to the same place, it goes to a Fed account. We, we own the same securities, which are just balances and securities accounts with the Fed. And so if, it's, if they're functionally identical, if it's identical to the private sector, in other words, if, whether the Fed's selling the bonds or the Treasury's selling the bonds, it, it's got to be the same thing. The only difference can be the accounting on their side of the ledger, the government side. And who, the accounting's just record keeping. So the idea was if we were to buy, and buy Treasuries from the Fed or from the Treasury, it, doesn't, it didn't matter to us because we own the same bonds. The money goes to the same place. It's functionally identical to the economy, whether the Treasury selling securities or the Fed selling securities. But when the Fed sells securities, it's for interest rate support. They're just trying to meet their interest rate targets to drain, drain reserves, you know, to uh, offer an interest-bearing alternative to reserve balances. Whereas if Treasury's doing it, it supposedly is funding expenditures. Well, it can't be both be right. And and so instantly I realized the whole thing is just a big reserve drain. The whole thing's just monetary. It's got nothing to do with funding expenditures. And in fact, the, 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 if you look at the government and its agents, they have to spend first before we can uh, buy bonds or before we can pay taxes. And you, we used to see on the, um, on the 15th of the month when the Treasury bonds matured or when the, treasury, the new Treasuries were settling and the uh, money was going to go, dollars were going to go from the economy to the Treasury, the Fed would come in and do repos. In other words, they would add the money to the system first before we could make our payments to the treasury, right? So uh, again, you know, because it's not there otherwise. So the whole, the whole thing just fell into place that the idea of treasury securities has nothing to do with funding expenditures, the government's spending first, and then selling treasury securities to uh, support rates as part of his rate support program, whether it knows it or not. And obviously they didn't know it. We, we understood that. So Italy was, must have been doing the same thing or was doing the same thing. So. I had uh, friends at um, Harvard Management at the time, Marie Samuels and Dave Middleman, and they were clients, and I go through it with them, and they said, you know what, let's go over to Italy just to make sure they understand this so that they don't push the wrong buttons, you know, before we load up on all these Italian <laughs> bonds. So uh, Maurice and I went over, and we met with uh, Professor Luigi Spavena, and he's sitting there in his office, kind of dressed like Keynes, you know, with a three-piece suit and a pipe and all that. Very British, and uh, and he's he's looking at us, and I know everybody there was trying to get there. Uh, Italy, it, it was very dark, you know, it was a very depressed environment. Everybody thought Italy was going to default. On his desk were two inch thick report from Rudy Dornbush, who was the MIT professor, who uh, was going around explaining why Italy was going to default because their debt ratios were too high and it was unsustainable and all the, the usual stuff. And every time we went to a meeting, his report was there on the guy's desk ahead of us. So there, there's a report. And, he, and I said to him, Professor Favena, this is just a rhetorical question. Don't answer it. But why is Italy selling all these BTPs, CCTs? Is, is it to fund expenditures? Or is it because if you spend the lira and don't sell them, the overnight rate will go to zero and your target is 12%. And the, he thinks for a minute and he goes, no, the rate won't fall to zero. It'll fall to half a percent because we have a half a percent support rate on reserves. And I knew I, we had the right guy. And then he just jumps up and he goes, you know, he goes, yes. He goes in there forcing us to act pro-cyclical. And he goes into this rage against the IMF. Okay, so we're supposed to be there for a 20-minute meeting. So the meeting like goes on for two hours. He's called in people from the other departments of treasury. They're, making us cappuccino and, there, and there's like celebration going on. And two hours later, we had to go out and go to our next meeting. And within the next day or so, the announcement came out of the treasury. No extraordinary measures will be taken. All payments will be made. And over the next, and the spreads immediately started going away. And over the next year, a couple of years, they went down to zero. And uh, we were the largest Italian bondholders outside of Italy at the time. Uh, you know, once we, felt comfortable that these people knew 
what buttons to push and that they weren't in any kind of default risk at all. And so that was, um, you know, that was the, the I, I didn't have a chance to think about that before that. I didn't have any reason to consider that before. So that's what gave me the reason to think about sovereign default and or think about, you know, who defaults and who does default risk in terms of uh, an issue of the currency like, uh, like Italy and the difference between floating and fixed exchange rates. And that immediately led to answering a lot of other questions such as, you know, look, the currency is a simple monopoly. The uh, central bank, the, the government and its agents are the sole supplier of the funds needed to pay taxes. And, the, and those are coercively imposed on the economy. So it's a simple case of monopoly. And the nice thing is when you take economics uh, micro, the first thing you learn is monopoly because it's the easiest one. It takes about a half hour. And they go through a couple of examples. And then you go on to oligopoly, and that takes a couple of days. Then they go on to competition. And that takes the rest of your life, right, with asymptotes and all kinds of <laughs> math, <laughs> mathematics, right? But monopoly, you don't need any of that. It's pretty simple. And your price setter, it's, you know, it's, there's no dispute about monopoly. It's an easy one. Well, the currency is a monopoly. If you get a little deeper into it, the monopolist sets two prices. How is thing exchanges for itself, which is called the own rate. And for a currency, that's the interest rate, how money exchanges for more money. It has to be set by them. And you see that in all the central banks. If they don't either pay interest on reserves or sell securities, if they do nothing in the absence of any action, it's a permanent zero rate policy. The only reason there's a positive policy rate is they either have securities or they pay interest on reserves or have some kind of, you know, take some kind of uh, proactive action to support rates or they fall back. So, you know, you hear this thing about financial repression where they're keeping rates artificially low. It's completely backwards. That's a fixed exchange rate concept. With floating exchange rates, if they don't do anything, rates are at zero. It's They have to take action to push them up to two, three, four, or five, and they have to continually take action to keep them there. If they let off the guard, uh, you know, like you have 9-11 or something, and they kind of slip up for a minute, the rates fall right back to zero. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's the opposite. So they set two things. They set how it exchanges for itself, and then they, the monopolist sets how his item exchanges for other goods and services. And that's the price level. So this is 1992 or three. We immediately recognized that source of the price level is the government telling us what we have to do to get the funds that we need to pay taxes. We need reserves to pay taxes. Um, you know, at the end of the day, that's, you know, there's no way around that. It's a simple monopoly, simple public monopoly. And so, you know, I look back and nobody else had any clue about what the source of the price level was. They'd already moved from money supply to, I don't know, inflation expectations, I guess. And there was one other thing in there they were using. I don't remember what it was. And they got to expectations kind of by default. And their whole theory of inflation is, well, we don't know why prices are where they are. Well, let's just call that historic. But we know why they move from one level to another. And we call that changing expectations. You know, they, they don't have any source of the price level. It's just an infinite regression, right? With, with no beginning. And so, uh, so I thought, look, we've got, you know, this is like, and, and at the time, Ross Perot is out there talking about default and getting 15 or 20 percent of the votes. And it just, Somehow I got the idea that, you know, I, I felt compelled to get this out to the public, to get it to well known. When I start, and I used to visit the Fed once in a while, and I'd talk to the, the operations guys, the senior staff guys in monetary operations, and they already knew this. <laughs> I wasn't telling them anything new. <laughs> yeah, you can't do a reserve drain without doing a reserve ad. Yeah, like, what's your point? Why are we even talking about this? And, uh, so yeah, we set the rate because it's a monopoly. If we don't set the rate, it's zero. We just have a meeting. We vote on it. You know, and I met with Bernanke in, oh, I don't remember the year, maybe 2006 or something. He was in between stints. He had been vice chairman of the Fed for four years. And then he became Fed chairman right after that. And he was at like the Council of Economic Advisors or something. And um, he said, to, he, he made a statement. There were just uh, two of us at the meeting, my partner and I. And, he had his assistant there. And he says, well, you know, when investment picks up and uses up the available funds, it's going to drive up interest rates. And I'm like, what? Did I just hear from the Fed, former vice chairman about to be Fed chairman? Like, there is no such thing, right? That's like fixed exchange rate stuff. 
yeah, he did his thesis on 1930 gold standard stuff for the depression. Okay. So that's how it was then where you had a fixed amount of money. And if you used it up, you'd drive up rates, but not, not in 2006, you know, they had, he'd been there for four years voting on the interest rate. What does he think when inflation picks up or investment picks up, somebody's going to grab his arm and force him to vote higher for rates or something? You know, didn't, didn't he understand that it's something you set by a vote you know? and, and they all have, you know, massive discussions in front of the meetings. How are these people going to vote? Nobody's talking about whether the market's going to drive up rates because available funds get used up. And it's, it's just astounding to listen to this stuff from the, you know, he, Chairman Bernanke. And he was a super nice guy and you know, nice, smart guy, no conspiracy, no edge to him or anything. You know, he's a real dedicated public servant, but he just didn't know how his own monetary operations work. Well, am I drone, droning on too long about this now? Do you, do you think the no? I think I find it fascinating, and please yeah. comments come in. But do you think the well, you just described loanable funds theory? Do you think um, do you think they get it? I mean, clearly now central banks are sort of moving away from that. Oh yeah, yeah, they moved away from it operationally with the Volcker thing, right? Yeah, I was there on the desk when Volcker was. You know, I remember Fed funds run one Wednesday with twenty eight percent bid no offer, and what happened is. He tried to, or he did, he told the, the Washington Fed, told the New York Fed, you, we're going to put a cap on borrowed reserves. Don't let them borrow more than $50 billion. We have to fight this inflation. Well, you can't do that, okay, because loans create deposits, and then you add up your deposits, and there's, the settlement date is, you know, uh, there's a date, and then two weeks later, you have to have your reserves posted. So your reserves are based on a calculation of your, deposits times whatever the reserve requirement is. And so if the reserve requirement comes out to 55 billion, then you have an overdraft in your account collectively as a banking system of 55 billion because reserve requirement is functionally an overdraft. And if they're only going to allow supply 50 billion, you're gonna be overdrawn by 5 billion. And there's no place it can come from. This is just a spreadsheet at the Fed. Nobody else can sneak in at night and make a debit or a credit, right? It's all their stuff. And if he's saying, to the New York Fed, you can't make a credit on your spreadsheet for this. You know, don't give them the money. Make them do something so they don't need it anymore. Well, you can't make the banks not need it anymore when it's based on a calculation of their deposits from two weeks before. <laughs> it's like absurd. So, so, so the Fed, so the New York Fed wouldn't lend them the money. So the, the discount rate was fourteen percent. Well, they could borrow it at fourteen from the Fed by just letting the overdraft stand. But they put a stigma. Oh, you need to come to the window to borrow? What's wrong with your bank? We need to send examiners over. I suggest you go borrow them. Well, I'm going to have to pay more than that. We don't really care. We've got instructions from Washington. And so it's like they came to the window to borrow, and the Fed slams the window on their fingers and chops them all off, right? So yeah. then, the stub, then they come back with their bleeding stubs, and they chop them off shorter again. So the banks are bidding with each other to avoid the, the, the stigma of going to the Fed for the money. When it's at the end, and then, you know, 28 bid, no offered Fed funds closed, and then the, the, the accounts come out a week later, and non bar reserves are 55 billion because they have to be. You can't change history, right? It, it, was, it was like really absurd. It was embarrassing to be an American to have a Fed chairman like Volcker, who they're going to put a statue to an honor for fighting inflation for having done such an idiotic thing as a Fed chair. He, he moved the control of the Fed funds rate, the bank policy rate, from Washington to, to New York with no instructions and just left those guys hanging out there trying to figure out what rate they should ultimately give the banks the money at, you know, high enough, not, not too low so they get yelled at by Washington and not too high so that the whole system doesn't fail. And either way, it's going to be an overdraft. So this is nuts. And, and, uh, and that's not what broke the inflation. It had nothing to do with it. It was the price of oil going from 30 to you know, 40 to 10, you know, which yeah. is a whole different process, right? That's what that really and, and so, Warren, how, did, yeah, how, how does it the leap get made from a bond trade and your sort yeah. of moment to saying, I've got to do something about this? How did, I mean, I, I know we've read, oh, yeah. read a bit about this. From that to academia and creating a school. So I got to find somebody who might be like, I can talk to about this. So uh, first I go to, uh, I worked at William Blair and Company, 
before that I, I'd left, uh, you know, after five years and moved on, started my own company, but we were still, uh, you know, uh, you know, good associates here on excellent terms. Ned Gennato was the head of the company. And he, he said, I talked to him about it. You know, I'd, I'd like to publish a paper or something. He says, well, you got to talk to Rummy. So Rummy is Don Rumsfeld. And Rumsfeld was his college roommate from Princeton class of 54 and uh, good friends. And he had worked with him on his campaign. He was a four-time congressman from Illinois. And, and William Blair and company, my firm, was in Chicago. And, uh, and Rummy was always in the office because he, he and Gennato were friends. So we used to chat once in a while. And he had Gennato set him up at GD Searle where he brought a NutraSuite and uh, you know, aspartame. That was, that was his development and made that company. And then uh, after that, he uh, went over to General Instrument and turned them around. He was the most competent person I ever met. He didn't necessarily agree with his politics or whatever, but his capability to get things done in an organization phenomenal. When he was Secretary of Defense, uh, weaponry went from 10 years from, it used to be 10 years from drawing board to battlefield. Once he, after he was there, it went from two years to drawing board to battlefield. So he, he's that kind of guy that can, you know, get those kind of results. So Ned's there, you got to talk to Rummy about this because, you know, he's got the contacts in the economics. I didn't know anybody in the economics world. So I call his office and uh, he's really busy. The only time he has is on maybe Tuesday or something where he's going to be in the steam room at the racket club in Chicago. Would you like to meet him there? <laughs> so I go, yeah, why not? <laughs> so I go to Chicago, I go to the racket club. And I'm sitting there with Don Rumsfeld in our towels in the steam room going over soft, it became soft currency economics. And he, he picked it up and wound up uh, directing me to eight or 10 of his, he wrote letters of recommendation to eight, eight or 10 of the people he knew, which was like, Samuelson and Laffer and McCracken and all the top names, right, of mainstream names. And I contact, started contacting him and it worked out with Art Laffer that he would agree to take my money to publish his paper. So I used his firm, a guy named Mark McNary did the editing and I dictated so they'd have their name on it. So it was papers got myself and Mark McNary on soft, soft currency economics. And uh, Art got the whole thing. He was an ex-University of Chicago professor. He could, you know, new learner from you know, by rote, he uh, understood the whole thing, agreed with it, support, you know, made contributions, but he wouldn't go there publicly ever before or after. I was, he had a guy named Tom Nugent uh, give me coverage from his firm for economics. And Tom and I go to a meeting and Art's there to give a talk in front of 200 people. And he gets up and he says, I'm going to tell the money story. And Art and Warren are here and uh, they tell it differently. And he says, they're right and I'm wrong, but this is the way I tell it. Then he gets up there and tells the whole thing backwards. You know, loans, you know, you put money in the banks and then they make loans and the whole loanable funds thing. And he, he comes, gets off the podium, he comes down. We're looking at him cross-eyed like, what was that? He goes, well, I said you were right and I was wrong. What's your problem? <laughs> so, I don't know. so anyway, it was... Uh, it, we finished soft currency economics. I got that out there. It didn't go anywhere. I, and the, um, I wound up somehow getting directed by somebody to a meeting of social policy was called in New York. And there were all these really old people who are like my age now, right? In their seventies. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I was, you know, early forties and I started talking about this and they're all like these New York liberal do-gooders. And, they, you know, mostly, um, uh, you know, they were mixed, some men and some women, but they were just not in tune to, uh, to it, except one guy. And I, I, I didn't remember his name, but he said, look, there's a group called Post-Keynesians Economists, and they're saying something like what you're saying. So maybe you ought to look them up. So um, I, I looked them up and wound up going, get, finding them on the Internet. There were these groups like Psy.econ and econ something. And I'd, I'd go on these discussion groups and they'd say something about the money supply and I'd straighten them out, so to speak, and get a bunch of pushback. And that went back and forth. And on that list were a lot of these post-Keynesians, I found out. And, um, and that was like P Paul Davidson and uh, Bill Mitchell and Randy Ray and Matt Forstadt. And a couple of them 
uh, were amenable to the ideas. They'd engage and, you know, we'd go back and forth and they started picking up on it. But it, it wasn't like easy, okay? It took a long time. It took probably a year. And Bill was one of them. And Bill had this thing he had done on the job guarantee, which back then was buffer stock employment, BSE, which became the name of mad cow disease. So he changed it to job guarantee. <laughs> as we call it, mad cow disease. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I said, look, Bill, you got the idea of this buffer stock thing, which is, you know, which works, you know, and it works for sheep and everything else. But there's two problems with it. Number one was, she, and Benjamin Graham did a lot of this stuff. Okay, I've been directed to him. Buffer stock. If you support the price of wool, it, you know, at something higher than market prices to, to for security, you wind up the streets are flooded with sheep, right? They just all the farmers have sheep, and the whole country gets overrun with sheep. So number one, you don't have that problem with people. If you give people jobs, the population doesn't go up. If anything, it goes down. So it's the opposite of most buffer stock. You have a yeah. buffer stock of of wheat, suddenly the whole country is flooded with wheat, right? Because you're paying above market price. So, so that's eliminated. I said, the other thing is you run out of money trying to keep the streets full of sheep, you know, but again, with the floating exchange rates like Australia has, that's uh, inapplicable. You don't run out of money and here's why. And I started going through the accounts and it was kind of complex. You know, it was, it was to, when you talk to non-monetary people about this stuff, it's, it's, you know, they're not sure if you're trying to, you know, here, I'm just some guy from the financial sector trying to explain. So I might be pulling something over on them, right? You got to be skeptical about something like that, especially when nobody else has ever said it before. So anyway, so uh, I went down to Australia and met with, met with him at his house out, I don't know, he was out living out in the bush somewhere back there and spent a couple of days and, you know, went through all the stuff and he's a smart guy and picked it up and he got enough, um, I guess, confidence or trust or whatever, what I was saying, you know, I uh, had enough self-confidence to, to trust his own instincts to decide what is right and what is wrong, where a lot of people can't do that. A lot of people don't trust their own sense of logic. Bill certainly does. You know, he's, he can do that. So uh, he started inviting me down to conferences. And then I'd be in, you know, really confrontations with all his mates down there in <laughs> economic. And he had been having problems, you know, uh, pushback from. And so you'll see a series of my early papers were written in the talks I gave in Australia. Exchange rate policy and full employment was a good one. And uh, at one point, they set me up with the, um, in Sydney, with a meeting with David Gruen, who was head of the, uh, he was research at the uh, Reserve Bank. Yeah. And my topic was government checks don't bounce. So I started explaining government checks don't bounce. And he raises his hand for a question and there's like dead silence because this is like the big showdown. And he says, well, look, if the, if the uh, rate of interest on the debt is higher than the growth rate, then it's unsustainable. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's really quiet. Everybody's now like on the edge of the seats. What's going to happen here? And I said, well, you know, I'm a uh, operations type of guy. What do you mean by unsustainable? Government's going to write a check to a pensioner and it's going to bounce or uh, they're going to go try to credit an account and the computer's going to give the operator an electric shock or he's not going to let the programmer do it. Like, what, 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 you, know, you know, when the interest rate, uh, the public debt gets up to $11.7 trillion, you know, and they go to credit somebody's account, they're not going to be able to do it. You know, what do you, what do you mean? Uh, you know, how's this? Uh, unsus what do you mean by unsustainable? Which is what everybody thought. You know, you can't make the payments. At some point, so um, he said he stops for a minute, thinks, and then he tries to crack a joke. He says, "Well, you know, I didn't think I'd have to come here to this meeting to try and uh, uh, remember, to, you know, how all the checks, you know, how all the operations work at the at the Reserve Bank." <sighs> you know, and he was, he was kind of being funny. Nobody laughed. They're just like they don't want to hear this. They wanted the answer, right? And finally, yeah. he said, "He goes, well, he says, no, we'll clear the check." But the currency will go down and inflation will go up. Okay, so that was like, that really broke the ice. Because that was, after that, the debate is over. You know, because that isn't what was unsustainable. So anyway, so I said to him, I said, well, look, you know, I understand that answer in, in excess spending. Demand can cause that uh, currency to go down. It can 
cause inflation to go up. But when you, you say unsustainable and when this rhetoric's in the newspaper, I think what people are worried about is that the pensioners won't be able to get paid and people in the government won't get paid and that, you know, there's going to be a default and, and uh, you know, the country's going to come to a standstill or something. He goes, he goes, no, I think that they're worried about inflation and currency depreciation. Now, Martin Watts was there. Do you know Martin? He's with, he was with Bill at Newcastle. So Martin looks over at David and he goes, the hell they are, David. <laughs> and David looks over at Martin and he goes, yeah, I guess you're right. Maybe that's not what they're worried about. <laughs> so anyway, after that, wow. the respect or whatever, or the you know, it got taken a lot more serious. And there were still questions about trade and things like that, but they, they all got, the responses now were a lot better received. And, and, I, and it started, Bill, you know, was getting a lot more traction. Just to get David there showed he'd already gotten a fair amount of traction, okay? I'm not trying to say there hadn't been some to get to that point to, to be able to be featured at a meeting like that but uh that was you know that that opened it up i think in australia to uh and gave the people who were working on the mmt and it wasn't called mmt then it's just working on the, the understandings the um uh, impetus to keep you know it, it, it was very encouraging it gave them everything they needed to know that they were right and they were on the right path and they were they were, they were fighting a good fight so and in the U.S., um, is that where you yeah. hooked up? Um, so in the U.S., it, on a parallel basis, it was, of course, I was working with all kinds of economists in the financial sector, people at J.P. Morgan and Deutsche Bank and those types of people all along, Credit Suisse, uh, and, um, and they were all, they, they, they were very quick studies. They got on board, you know, right away. Some of them did at all and still have it, but the, the good ones, it take them, you know, two or three minutes they were they were there and our, our client base was all there we had five or six uh institute large institutional clients and they were all on board harvard management people like that and uh and and, and working with their uh, associates the dealer community and everybody else and it, so in the financial sector it was it they, they caught on pretty quickly the, the academic side was uh randy ray was the uh primary one. Pavlina Chernova was a grad, was an undergrad. She came down, did a several months in my office in West Palm Beach, and she wrote that paper on um, monopoly pricing, which are, it's our definitive math model that is the micro foundations for uh, modern monetary theory. They're right yeah. there. As they say, we don't have micro foundations. They're right there. All and the math is all spelled out. So if anybody asks about micro foundations, just point to that paper. And then, um, uh, they started having me go with them to conferences. So I go to the American economics, whatever it was. And I go to, I remember going with Bill to some conference in Chicago in January. I didn't go back there. It was miserable. <laughs> it was about 40 <laughs> degrees and raining and, oh. but anyway, but we slogged through all that stuff. And, and um, we had our own academic or conference in 1996 at Bretton Woods in New Hampshire where I had several central bankers, among them Charles Goodhart, who's always been a strong ally operationally, the same way the other um, uh, central bank staff staffers were, except he was you know, not a staff guy. He was like Mon monetary policy committee. Uh, yeah. You know, he was a serious guy. He wrote, he could write faster than I could read. He had like 50 books uh, <laughs> endogenous money that are still classics to read. I mean, they're, they're excellent. And uh, he picked up on the whole idea of uh, the monopoly side of it and the pricing and came up with uh, the M and the C theory. The money wrote a nice paper. It was nice reference. It's always just been a pleasure working with him. And, uh, but we can get back to it later. Is still a firm proponent of the idea that raising rates is tightening and lowering rates is easy. We'd have a lot of discussions on that. He'd see all the logic, but he, he just wouldn't go there. And, uh, and nobody can prove the marginal propensity. So I, I can't, you know, I don't, I don't fault him for that. So anyway, um, uh, but I think since our discussions that for the last 20 years, history has shown that the marginal propensities to spend out of interest income are, are, are not as extreme as they needed to be for him to be correct on that issue. But I'm sure if he were here today, he'd tell me why 
why I might be wrong. And, and you know, yeah, it's, it's, and, a, and, it's a legitimate debate. It's a legitimate debate. So, and Warren, yeah. 20, 20 years later, yeah, here we are. How do you think it develops from here? What, what, what's your hope? Well, like the big breakthrough was, um, there were a couple of them. And, and um, you know, the, the New York Times did an article on me in 2006, I think, or something, maybe 2013, 12, I don't know. It was a while ago. And it, this, Laura, this woman comes down, and I gave her all the stra straight stuff, and she just does a total hit job on it. And uh, you talk about fake news. This was the worst. I mean, she just... I'd tell her like what happened with the Russia fund. I, I wasn't even part of the firm. I left six months earlier. She writes in the article, Mosler's not always right. He lost a lot of money in the Russia trade. I wasn't even at the firm and I told her about it. She knew it. Okay, so it was just malicious. And maybe maybe it's because of the New York Times had Krugman there and we were a little bit at odds. I, I don't know what was going on, but something was going on. But what happened was it got on the front page of the business section. And just being on the front page of the business section, right or wrong, drew attention to it and gave it enough credit. It's credible enough where the New York Times would write about it. They didn't put every crackpot theory you know, on money on the front page of the business section. So it must have been, it gave it enough credibility for people to start noticing it. So there was a, a ratcheting up then. And then the next thing of note was Stephanie Kelton um, taking that job as uh, with, with uh, in the Senate Budget Committee, uh, which was chaired by Bernie Sanders. And no heterodox economist, never mind MMT, had ever been in a, that kind of a serious Washington economics position. And uh, she didn't even want to take the job. I had to like talk her into it and, you know, and beg and say, you can't not do this. This is a, a chess move. And she took the job and just did phenomenally well. And, you know, you could say the rest is, is history. And, uh, and then getting to know AOC, you know, uh, she and Pavlina, just enough for her to make the statement that modern monetary theory should be a part of our conversation. That's all she said. And that just ratcheted up another notch, right? And then the book comes out, and now it's like, uh, you know, so that worked from that end. And then there's a whole movement in Italy, which was another front. So, <laughs> you know, so there was, like, which was uh, phenomenally strong. These guys are today... And the top three major parties are all the economists or MMT activists. I mean, I mean, they each have MMT activists that are influ highly influential in their policy decisions. And so it's been, there have been a lot of fronts, you know, for, for it. There's a the financial sector, there's Australia, there's the U.S., there's been Italy. And it's kind of been an all of the above attack, right? That, um, and, you know, you kiss a lot of frogs on the way up, but that's, that's the way it goes. <laughs> <laughs> And, and for the U.S. with this election coming up, do you think yeah. does does anything change, or is, you know, what's going on there? Well, I, don't, I don't understand. Well, but they just ran twenty percent of GDP deficits without even discussing taxes. Yeah. So obviously something's changed, right? That never yeah. would have happened. So you could say, and the same thing in Australia, I guess. I don't know, but uh, but certainly uh, around the world. And uh, so you could say at this point, MMT has save the world. Not that they understand it properly or anything, but it's provided whatever understanding, you know, sufficient understanding for them to just massive blowout deficits. Uh, not that long after talking about, you can't do that, right? All of a sudden they just do it without discussion. So, so you know, you can't say that modern monetary system isn't what has saved the world at this point with the whole COVID thing. Yeah. Now, not that they're ever going to give us credit for it, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. And I suspect a lot of us who, you know, who are recent into the MMT, the, the one thing that I also like is that, which is a core part of it, is the jobs guarantee. Are you seeing yeah. governments anywhere? Are you seeing any movement to make that sort of part of the main conversation? No, that's been a little bit of a disappointment. And I think it's because um, the way they're marketing it, let's say, and um, and the way it comes about, it comes about from the, I mean, I came up with this 
you know, in soft currency economics, 1992, when I was working with Mark McNary, just in a paragraph, it said, once you understand how the account's clear, now there's no reason you can't have an employed buffer stock. And I didn't have any vested interest in it. I'd never written anything about it before. Bill had done a thesis on it five years before, so I'm not trying to take credit for the idea, but just but the idea is that once you understand floating exchange rates, this I use it as an example of a policy option that becomes viable. Yet there were a lot of policy options that were kind of bleeding heart and uh, options, but they weren't, you know, viable under the uh, understanding of monetary systems, which was kind of a fixed exchange rate paradigm, right? But once you understood the floating exchange rate paradigm, then all these uh, things become viable. Now it became even, but it's even more than that. And I did that paper, with full employment and price stability, to point it out. So we start the money story very differently than anybody else. The money story always starts with two people on an island and bartering, and then they start using seashells or something, or <laughs> people are bartering. And how do you trade, trade a bulldozer blade for a chicken? So you start you use where Even certain back. kids with business cards, how do you get your children yeah. to do housework so, out here? <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I start the story as a state, a state that wants to provision itself. That's the money story. And then what, what these uh, you know, proponents have done, you know, like Randy and Pavlina and Stephanie, they go back in history and find out that's exactly what happened. Now, I didn't have any idea. I, I've never even read Keynes, okay? I've read quotes of Keynes, but I've never taken the book and read it. I've never read any of these old comics. So, you know, my ideas were independent. They were based on monetary operations. They weren't based on any economic study. Uh, and so they were based on finance. And uh, so the state wants to provision itself. So how do you get people out of the private sector into this public sector? Okay, well, you, you know, and you start with a tax. You, you don't start with a collecting a tax. You start with a tax liability. So the tax liability becomes first, comes first to move people, to, to cause people to need your money. Okay, because you can have all the dollars you want if nobody needs it for anything. They're, they don't have, you, you can't provision yourself with the dollars. You want to be able to provision yourself with these otherwise worthless dollars. So you put tax liabilities on everybody and think I use property tax because it's simple, real estate tax uh, in Australian dollars. And now there's a demand for Australian dollars and people will come out to work for Australian dollars, now, and, you know, rather than lose their homes. And so the government can now provision itself by spending Australian dollars. So people come to, uh, are looking for work. They get hired, they get paid. Now they can pay the tax afterwards. So tax liabilities come first to create people looking for work, which we call unemployment. So that's the other big MMT contribution. The cause of unemployment is tax liabilities or our tax liability. No, the cause of unemployment is tax liabilities. Okay, by design, there is no unemployment without a tax liability. So as we define it, people looking for the state currency, jobs that pay in the state currency. So the, the, the purpose by design of taxation is to create unemployed people for the further purpose of the state hiring them to serve public purpose, which is how we do it. That's fine. Okay, now, if you've got unemployed, it means your tax created more unemployment than the government wanted to hire. So you made a mistake. <laughs> Either that or you just did it out of spite or something. I mean, but I don't think so. Let's, let's give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Innocent fraud, right? But let's give them a benefit of the doubt and say uh, it's a mistake. So you, so you either got to hire the rest of the people for public service because you created the unemployed with your stupid tax or lower the tax and let them go back to the private sector where they came from. And because um, in this model, they all start in the private sector. We can argue whether historically they start in the private sector ever. You know, maybe Adam and Eve were in public sector. I don't know. But, you know, it doesn't matter. The model starts with, uh, without a state. The state arises and provisions itself from this, its surroundings, whatever you want to call that, with a tax on the surroundings. And so, um, but the problem with lowering the tax to get unemployed back into the private sector is that they've been uh, stigmatized. They've been, they're damaged goods because the private sector doesn't like to hire people who are unemployed. They want to hire people already working because they know they come in every day and they get along with people and they take a bath and you know whatever else, they can get a report from their supervisor. So by giving them 
so how do you get them to transition from unemployment, which was a mistake created by the state over taxation in this case? Uh, if it's underspending, then just spend. You don't have to have a job guarantee. Just go hire everybody. Okay. Yeah. But if you don't want them, you think they're better off in the private sector, then you've got to transition them back. So have a job guarantee where you give everybody a job uh, who wants one for the further purpose of um, promoting the transition from unemployment to private sector, facilitating the transition back to the private sector, making them employable again to the private sector. And in fact, it, it works that way. The Hefe's program in Argentina fully demonstrated that. It was Daniel Kosar was at the labor ministry and uh, he had gone to University of Missouri, Kansas City, worked with Matt Forstatter and Pavlina and Randy under, and read my paper, which was back then on uh, full employment price stability. And he set it up in 2001, the Hefe's program, where they offered a job to every head of household after the uh, peso collapsed and they floated. And they got 2 million people into that program out of a population of 33 or 35 million, which is huge, hmm. uh, over a two-year period or three-year period, or 2 million came in. And 1 million of them transitioned to the private sector. There's never been that kind of a migration from people who no one ever thought would work, ever. And this, this socioeconomic group had never, who entered this program, they were all like Indians and people who were considered you know, lower levels of humanity who had never worked in the private sector, never were expected to. Suddenly a million of them had transitioned to the private sector and then Daniel left and somebody, the next guy in used his budget to do something else and it all fell apart. But, um, but anyway, Pavlina went down and documented it, interviewed the people and wonderful stuff they did. So, so we, so to me, the way you present this program is, and it's, it, you know, do you use the expression down there, look, I don't have to outrun the bear, I only have to outrun you? Have you ever heard yeah. that, Annie? Right? So you don't have to, like, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be better than unemployment. And that yeah. should be enough to do it. Right? So, number one, it's a better price anchor than unemployment because even with large numbers of unemployed, you can get inflation through the wage side because the private sector doesn't consider those people employable and drives up wages for the people who are employable. Okay, and, yeah. and so because now it's got an employment pool that facilitates this transition, it's a far better buffer stock. So it's like if you've got a buffer stock of wool, you want to make sure you keep the wool fresh and clean. Otherwise, when the price goes up, if it's got, you know, it's dirty and it's got bugs in it, you can't sell it. So you want to keep your buffer stock of labor employable as, mu as much as possible so that when the private sector picks up, they're going to hire these people and not have shortages. And so you do that by putting them in, have employed jobs, you know, employed in, in jobs. So when somebody says, well, what are all these people going to do? The first answer should be, well, they're going to transition into the private sector. We're going to be either lowering taxes or increasing public spending to increase aggregate demand so that they transition into the private sector. Or when we increase public spending, we may hire them directly. So they're either going to get hired into regular public sector jobs or they're going to be in the private sector. Right now, the, we've already hired everybody we want in the public sector. Right now, the plan is to transition them into the private sector. And the only and, reason- and, it's a nice, and, and Warren, it's also a nice, um, it's got a nice auto fiscal stabilizer about it too, right? Yeah, well, so does unemployment. You know, but th and this one might be better because you pay more, but you know, and, and it, it's more liquid, it's more fluid, so it's a little better. That, that's yeah. true. But that doesn't make it a lot better than unemployment. Remember, we have to be better than unemployment. Yeah. Yeah. So because they transition so much easier to be used as a price anchor, you might need only one or two percent in the JG force rather than four or five percent in the unemployed to have the Nehru right concept. Not that I believe in that, but whatever amount you need to have as a buffer stock, you can have a much smaller buffer stock if it's a job guarantee than if it's unemployment. So it's yeah. superior to unemployment in that sense, because then you have more people doing private sector work or regular government sector work, okay? And so Bro. you, okay, so, so you're getting these people in there initially, there's a lot of them because we've you know, made a bad mistake creating all this unemployment, but the whole point is we're gonna transition them out. Okay, that's why they're going in. You know, and now, and to me, that's the right answer. They say, well, what are they gonna do exactly? And I say, well, and, and my plan is, well, first I would say, we could do a lot of things, but my, 
uh, initial thoughts are to um, have the federal government fund qualifying nonprofits to help stamp envelopes for the uh, American Cancer Society or the Heart Association, you know, save the children or whatever. These people all have volunteer work, let them pay people the job guarantee wage, you know, to, to, uh, hi, you know, to hire all the unemployed as opportunity. Then I'd go to state and local governments, uh, you know, who are fiscally constrained and say they can hire people to assist them in their different departments, the police department, the human services, whatever, the fire department, to, uh, they can take on as many assistants as they want at the JG wage, whatever that is, and, and it's a fixed wage. And they're all gonna get funded by the federal government. Now, they have to be wary because the private sector is gonna be paying more money through competitive forces and they're probably gonna lose a lot of these people. They don't hire them as normal public service, but in the meantime, they can hire all they want. And so yeah. I, would, I would go through those two stages first, and then see if anybody's left. That's and you know, and, and and you know, Randy says something like, "Well, what about all these X, Y, Z people? They're not going to get hired." And I say, "Well, look, you you could open up a private nonprofit that designed to hire those people to do whatever you want." And you get funded. And he goes, well, okay, as long as I can do that. Okay, so there, there are plenty of people who, if they see people falling between the cracks, you know, they can have a nonprofit, go hire these people to do whatever they want, get funded. And, you know, we already do that. There's already a lot of people that do that. And uh, if you could fund it, it would certainly, I think that would mop up everybody. Yeah, you know, what I don't true. like, what I don't like is when they start saying, there's all these green jobs that need to be done. I really don't like that because to me, I, I want those done more than anybody, but I want them to be regular public service jobs at normal public service pay scale. I don't want this thing to perceive, be perceived in any way as undermining, you know, the hard fought level of public sector compensation that we have now. Yeah. I, I don't want to see all of a sudden j job guarantee people making half the money as, you know, the other people doing this stuff. They, what you'd have to hire for normal public service. I don't want this thing to be there as a way for the government to save money when it hires people to do green jobs. Yep. Okay. We don't need that. We can, yep. we can pay them regular wage. Okay. We don't need to do that. We can hire as many as we want. We don't have to sneak them in with a job guarantee. It makes it look like you're running away from the police when you're not guilty. Yep. It's, and, and, it, and it undermines your support from public sector workers. And I know that, some of these pe people in their way go out of their way to say, yeah, they're going to be doing this, but we'll make sure they're not being substituting and they're not displacing anybody. Well, these should be new public sector jobs. They're already, they're displacing the new guy who should have been hired out of college. Yeah, and, fair enough. Okay, you know, Warren, well, just, yeah. Jane's just put up and I'm glad yeah. Jane's keeping time. There's probably questions to open it up. Thank you, Jane. Um, I, I could speak yep. to Warren all day, actually. I found this really fascinating. But uh, Jane, over to you just on the, the Q&A. All right. I might um, lead, um, kick off with a question about the, um, the job guarantee because there's been quite a sort of um, hot debate here or on Twitter and across you know, the um, MMT community. So just um, whether, and the, the debate has been around whether those who are able to work but choose not to participate in a job guarantee should continue to be paid a social security income or not. And so just would appreciate your yeah. thoughts on this. And do you think would this, would doing so undermine the job guarantee and the, its price stability functions? Yeah, so let's go back to our model of the state wants to provision itself. So it puts a tax on everybody's house and then it decides, you know, people shouldn't have to pay the tax if they don't want to, you know, work for the state to pay the tax. So we're just going to give everybody enough money to pay the tax. Okay, so what's the point of the whole exercise? You haven't provisioned the state. You can't because people don't need the money to pay the tax anymore. It just all falls apart. Now, if you give them half of what they need to pay the tax, so some people still have to work and everything else, well, Okay, you could have just made the tax half as high, I suppose, right? You know, so if you look, if you look at, if you look at it in its elemental form, without all the complexities of modern society, and uh, just to understand the dynamics, 
is that you're, you're introducing an enormous moral hazard risk if it's a living wage. If it's high enough to live off of and enough people start taking it, the supply side collapses and there's nothing for sale, which is what I was talking about in this model. You know, there's nobody, there is no unemployment anymore because at all. So there's nobody to hire for anybody because there's nobody looking for paid work. And the whole system doesn't function and it can't, it doesn't function. So if you pay less than a living wage, then it might be, it can work. Okay. So if a living wage is $5,000 a month and you pay 2000, you're not going to undermine the monetary system, but you're playing with fire because you know, if it creeps up a little bit too much and becomes somehow you know, a, a living wage, it, it's, it's, it's a serious problem. So the problem you're trying to solve with this, I think, is better solved in other ways. Do you want a community where people don't have to um, be coerced into the public sector? Do you want it to be just a volunteer public sector? That's what you're talking about. Do you want it to be just a volunteer army? I don't know. Do you want it to just be a volunteer government where people volunteer for the government? They don't need the money. It's not about pay. You just have, um, you know, farmers, I guess, and or agri some kind of agrarian society or whatever. And uh, people are just going to work a month, a year each for the government or something. I, I don't even know how you do it. So do you want, you know, the way we've built our societies is on coercion. You, we create a shortage of money through taxation. It coerces everybody to work to the common good through, you know, because the government determines what you have to do to make a living. It's actually determining the entire pay scale across the board. If you trace it, all the institutional structure decides whether somebody collecting the garbage gets paid more or less than somebody doing cancer research, because there is no natural scale for that. You could say, people collecting the garbage should get paid more because they don't live in air conditioning and everything else, right? So there's, there's no natural breakdown. You can trace that all back to the institutional structure that's legal structure that surrounds us. So uh, it would be, if everybody's gonna be guaranteed a basic income, if, it, if it's decided that people should be able to uh, not have to work, able-bodied people should be able to not have to work, not contribute to the society, and be able to survive at a comfortable level, there's a contradiction in there. It's a fallacy of composition. Everybody can't do it. So you're going to have to somehow ration who can do it and who can't, I think. And so I don't, I don't know how you ultimately ration that. It's not going to happen the first day, but you'll get yourself in a position where, you know, it's like having a leisure class. How do you ration that? It used to be by birth, right? You have royalty and they didn't have to work. They all had titles and pensions and whatever. And now if you'd give social security or pensions to uh, people over age 65 or 70, there's no moral hazard in that. You're not going to have somebody 30 years old decide to not work because someday he's going to get pension. Okay. So that's okay. If, you, if you're doing it to people who are disabled and can't work, no moral hazard. If you're doing it to women to take care of their children. There's no moral hazard. Yeah. Okay. So, I don't see it. I, I, you know, the idea that women will just have a lot of children, maybe, but I've never taken that too seriously. I know there's all these anecdotes, but at the macro level, I've never taken it too seriously. So, uh, but I'm not, you know, and I might be wrong, but I, but the bigger point is you look for moral hazard. And mm -hmm. I, I see extreme moral hazard in the context of able bodied people not having to contribute to society, not, you know, mandatory contribution. Yeah, I don't. I don't I'm, not, I'm not sure humanity can work that way. Maybe it can, you know, or you just get back into that we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us uh, type of society, which we've seen that happen a lot. Yeah, I um I agree about the moral hazard, and I wonder whether with um even with a sort of an uh, income guaranteed income below a living wage that it would mean that the, um, which the, is sort of the job guarantee functions really as like a, a guarantee to equal opportunity to work, but also the, and this yeah. is something that Rowan Gray has, um, I 
picked up yeah. on the podcast that, but also the um, the guarantee to the equal distribution um, of the obligation to work. And so, if without yeah. that, the distribution to the obligation to work, then the people that will bear the burden of the jobs that um, our common good relies upon, <laughs> like the common project. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, we fall have, upon the sort of the people less able to. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we had a situation here where you could not collect Social Security and work at the same time mm -hmm. back in the 70s. And it was Clinton who got rid of that on a Friday because it was an embarrassment because it was budget busting so that you could collect Social Security when you retired and you could work and keep your money. And what happened after that is probably by the millions, older people went out and started working. And so, because they weren't going to be a damn fool and work for nothing, you know, make $200 a week and lose $200 a week Social Security. I'm not going to do that. Even though they wanted to work and liked to work, they weren't, they weren't going to, I called it the damn fool theory, right? And they'd say, I'm going to be a damn fool and work for nothing. But once they could collect both, it's, ah, you go to Florida, you got all these people 70, 80, 90 years old working in all the convenience stores and everything else, which they really want to do. Be, and that was done by removing that, you know, restriction. And so, it tells you that um, people do want to work, okay, and they will work if they can get something extra to improve themselves, even if they are getting an income. But um, the Social Security was never quite enough to live on. Mm. It was always sufficient. So I don't know how that would have worked if they were making a lot, you know, enough Social Security to actually live on. But we do have a little bit of history with that, and there's probably a study that could be done to you know, to help resolve that. Now, Ro Rowan, of course, would like to see, you know, um, the job guarantee used, uh, you know, to enhance public sector employment because he thinks we need a lot more public sector employment. And I don't disagree with that, but that's, you know, that to me, that's for the voters to decide, you know, that's you know, how much do we want private sector? How much do we want public sector? I don't have a personal agenda to go all public sector or all private sector or anything like that. I see public sector is absolutely necessary for public infrastructure for public purpose. And then you have to decide what that is. Yeah. And I think um, Stephen has, Stephen Howes just commented that jobs are not necessarily a burden, they are opportunity. And I suppose also thinking about how um, the notion, like the definition of what is work needs to be broadened. And that's also yeah. what has um, a lot of the MMT is including yourself and Bill, are talking about what will be considered work and it's beyond what is now considered you know um valuable work so right that's, yeah and i I see, I see the job guarantee even with basic income as a place for people who want to work and want to transition into private sector okay. you know into some kind of career or something Okay, so we might I might move to um, the Q and A box. We have um, a, you know quite a few questions now, so okay. um, I'll start with um, uh, where. Sorry, um, Tina Ryan was the first to ask a question. I'll just ask that question for you. It's um, the expression that money is a tax credit. Credit is met with much um, criticism from anti. MMT is, I think that's what it's meant. How is money a tax, as a tax credit justified? Is, uh, so thanks. Well, that's, you know, that's exactly what it is. Uh, if I tell you, you know, some, if the government says some, your signed business card is worth 10 Australian dollars to pay taxes, it's going to be worth $10. And that's a tax credit. If you get tax credits for putting in solar energy, it's the same as money. It's a tax credit. You know, if they're transferable, you can transfer them to other people. People will buy them from you to use them to pay their taxes. It's a thing that's used to pay taxes, and that's what it is. Now, I think they confuse what it is with what it does. So it might give people a medium of exchange. It might be a store of value. That's how it functions for people. But that's what tax credits do. So I think it's just, uh, you know, a definition. The thing to pay tax is called the tax credit. You need, you need a credit in your account to be able to have your taxes paid and you get that that credit is called dollars. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think it's a matter of accounting definition. 
I don't think it says anything more than that. Okay. All right. So um, the next question well, is... Um, why would anybody object to that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Tina might want to comment on in the chat in response to your answer. Yeah. Um, I'll go now to Gonzalo Martinez, and he was keen to ask, I think he did have his hand up to ask the question, his questions live. Um, I can allow you to talk now, Gonzalo, so you can ask your questions live. Are you there? Where are you? Hi, Gonzalo. No. Okay, I might go to the next person unless um, Gonzalo, oh, there we go, allow to talk and unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, we've got you now, yeah. <laughs> okay. Hello, so, sorry Hi. for my English. Here is Gonzalo from Argentina. And my question to Warren is the following. It's a, a little bit long and, well, when a bank uh, makes a loan, uh, interest rates, policy rate is supposed to uh, prevent or expand loan creation, right? Uh, I, wa I'm, I was wondering how is, do that happen because the, the actual, the policy rate today only affects the cost of reserve for today, but not the cost of reserve for like one year or two years that the loan will be outstanding. So how does policy rate today affects loan creation today if the cost is like two or three years long for, for the, the loan? Okay, so number one, a lot of loans are made on a floating rate basis, which means if the policy rate changes, the loan rate changes. So it might be a loan made out LIBOR or LIBOR plus 1% or LIBOR plus 2%. Uh, the other thing is banks can borrow a term to fund their loan. So the banks have a cost of funds for two-year money. They can go out in the market and borrow for two years to fund a two-year loan. And they can do it directly by uh, um, taking in two-year time deposits, or more likely they'll do it indirectly by doing things like uh, hedging, uh, you know, selling Eurodollar futures. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but... In other words, they can do it in the financial markets where they're guaranteed a rate for um, two years, three years, four years, 10 years, whatever, actually all the way out to 30 years. Uh, and they can do it in futures markets or they can do it in the what's called the LIBOR swap market, which is a uh, interbank market for fixed exchange rates. Now, what's important to remember is the bank regulators do not allow banks to take interest rate risk. They can't lock in your rate for two years and then borrow the money day to day. They would have to, uh, they would have to lock in that rate for the whole time. Otherwise, if rates were to go higher, they would lose, and then the government, you know, would wind up bailing them out. So they have very strict regulation against banks taking risk on interest rates. Does that help? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, um, Gonzalo. I'll just um, uh, mute you now. And the next question will be from um, Bernard Thompson. And Bernard also would like to ask his question live. So I'll just unmute you now, Bernard. Okay. So, so, so my question is really about um, whether MMT is more an issue of justice or more an issue of economic management. So I, I start the question with, if, given that money is a creature of the state, does or should this apply, imply that all state expenditure be determined by principles of justice and social equality or social equity? Um, in addition or extending from that, does it also imply that wages and salaries are more about a just allocation of entitlement rather than, so to speak, a measure of economic performance, however that might be done. So right. really, I've, the, the question is a little bit between the social justice side of things and the economic uh, performance issues that uh, are, are raised for MMT. Okay, so look, what, what MMT 
CFT does is provide an understanding of the uh, monetary system that the other schools of thought so far haven't done. And uh, in other words, it tells you how it works. Now, that, that would apply to anything, okay, whether you have social justice or not. It would just tell you how it works. And so, as a, but personally, as a progressive economist, yes, I'm looking, for, you know, what happens is that policy options like the ones you spoke about, um, you, know, you know, are opened up by an understanding of the monetary system that weren't there before under the old misunderstandings, right? So before MMT, let's say, you know, 1990s and even a couple of years ago, uh, the option of 20% of GDP deficit spending in re response to COVID was not, was not even a consideration. Well, now it just happened without even discussion. So it, it opens up policy options that weren't there. Now, it's about how you use the option. And, and also, I think I said earlier, I completely agree with you that um, uh, it's the institutional structure that determines, you know, all the compensation and, and the whole thing. So do, do you have, do you want to ask something more specific about it or, because I. Well, well you know. uh, there was for, uh, earlier mention about, you know, inducements to work. What if everybody had an entitlement, they'd just stay on the couch. That I think is a, a question that could be researched a lot further because I would suggest that most people participating in this webinar have a lot of motivation to be active that has nothing to do with remuneration. So right, exactly. now that's not to say that that's not a factor, of course it is, yeah. but and it'll vary depending on circumstance, whatever. But I yeah. think that needs to be uh, explored rather than deemed to be a fixed issue that is often quoted, oh, well, if you just give people money, they'll yeah. do nothing. Uh, All right. Well, you have it's to... probably false. Yeah, well, look, I, I agree. But look, at source, the question is, how do you provision the state? How do you provision collective action? How do you get people in the military? How do you get a legal system? You know, how are you going to do that? Okay, what, you know, what what is the... Okay, and so once you've decided to use coercive taxation, to create unemployment, to be able to hire people into it. Now you've created, you, you've provisioned the state by creating a general need, more than a general need, a desperate need for the currency. And it's ongoing and it, it's got serious psychological consequences. Okay. You know, cause taxes are, it's like a hole in your bathtub where the water's continually running out and you better keep finding ways to get water in or you're going to dry up and die. And so, um, if you look at artwork, you know, non-monetary societies produce different artwork than monetary societies. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty insidious means of provisioning the state, but it works. Okay. And the states are well provisioned and the states win the wars, right? And the states create all kinds of things and survive. And uh, you could say prosper in some ways, but there's a cost to it. And the, the coercive side of it is definitely, you know, a human cost to this whole uh, progress of Western civilization. I don't disagree with you, but you've got to come up with an alternative way to provision the state. And that, too many, you know, I haven't heard any. And, and, and because the state is so important, important in modern society, if you can't provision it, you know, you're, you're, you're Somalia, right? Indeed. And that's all on behalf of the citizenship. I mean, that's really... Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Bernard. I um, will now um, ask a question on behalf of Matthew Walton. And Jordan Thompson has a similar question along the, you know, this, along the similar lines. The first question from Matthew is directed to Con. Um, and he asks, has MMT changed your views on how to invest and what impl implications does MMT have for the superannuation industry? And Jordan asks on you know, a similar question. So what extent has your understanding of MMT been able to inform your portfolio decisions? And that was, Jordan would like to hear both Con and Warren comment on that. So maybe Con, you can, Start up, start off. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start with why I ended up with MMT 
um, in the first place. And that's because the dissatisfaction for me with the idea of a neutral rate or a Taylor rule for short-term interest rates, the whole concept of the Phillips curve and Nairu, I was trained in the traditional, what they call the ISLM models. So what is normal? After the GFC, the whole thing about what Minsky, about you know having an unstable economy or, or basically leverage in normal times, creating the instability. What is a bond yield curve and the widow maker? So I'm old enough now to see Japan, Germany, the US, and even Australia seeing 10-year <clears throat> bond rates clear at double digits, and here they are now, all below 50 basis points, Australia is a bit higher. And so the answer is yes, it has changed the way I think about economics and how I think about economic policy and how I think about market instruments. But actually I think MMT, this is, gets to Bernard's question, is, is also a deeper meaningful thing is how can it do the greater good? And the greater good is how you can provide for your citizens. Um, one of the frustrations I think with a pure interest rate monetary policy it's, it's created a lot of asset inflation. Has it actually benefited the people and has it benefited the structures? And so you do have this crisis that hits you and what can you do this better? The answer from then, from superannuation, can you put investments that are longer term for the greater good? Infrastructure where the government can help you or, or doesn't want to get involved. Areas and investments where you can build the economy. So the, the mind shift is happening in terms of how you think about portfolios. Probably the easiest answer is one is just because it bond yield curves are low, don't sell them. Or more importantly, don't go short them because you're going to lose a lot of money from a purely uh, financial point of view. <laughs> okay. And, um, yeah. and Warren, what would you yeah. like? Let me ask, uh, so if you look at Japan, 30 years of zero rates and more quantitative easing than anybody. And yet asset prices, especially stocks, haven't gone anywhere. They're half of what they were 30 years ago. And if you look at the European Union, they haven't had any asset price inflation either. And it's, it's been the United States, right? So, uh, and the Europe's got negative rates. So the idea that it's the rates causing it in the United States, to me, is like suspect. You know, and it's actually something else that we've got going on here that's causing this asset price inflation. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, I think you're right. I think it's not just rates. Um, uh, but um, and the other thing, probably since the GFC that we're getting, we, particularly in the States, but everywhere in the world, the larger companies are getting a disproportionate share, whether it's profits, whether they're growing at the expense of the smaller or medium-sized companies. We are, we are actually getting into a, a, a scenario where the bigger are getting bigger, the, there is a winner-take-all mentality, and therefore that justifies their share prices going up through the roof. So, Warren, there's a lot, a lot of forces at play. Um, yeah. If anything, despite the, the so-called large deficits that everyone's saying, you need more. This is this is what I'm learning. This is this is yeah. we need more um, fiscal. We actually need more investment into you know the whole sort of Kalecki equation. And again, let me put a plug for Stephen's book, who does a great job um, going through that. Um, you actually need more of what what, what MNT is saying and less of perhaps what traditional monetary policy is trying to do. Yeah, I, I think these zero rates are deflationary and. I, I use them as the base case for analysis and, and the rest in, in these asset price moves and everything else. I, I look for some other explanation. Uh, I just don't see it. I just don't see the rates doing that, especially if you look at forward prices. Okay. Cause with zero rates, your forward pricing is flat. Yep. So every actor in the economy, when he looks at, you know, if you're a goldsmith, what am I going to have to pay for gold spot? What am I going to have to pay forward? It's always the same with zero rate. Yep. And um, if you raise rates to 10%, the forward prices go up 10% a year continuously. Yeah. Okay. That's the academic definition of inflation, right? A continuous increase in prices faced by current actors, current people in the market when they go to buy and sell for, you know, for the future. And so I find that I, I conclude that, at least academically speaking, the policy rate is the rate of inflation. 
and, and not that it, um, not that prices will move there over time, but that's where they are instantaneously right yeah. now. And they might go anywhere over time, but I'm not saying it's a predictor of spot prices, but what I'm saying is it's a, it's a description. It's, it's where real people have to buy and sell at real prices, you know, or, or the forward prices. If you want to yeah. build a house and it's going to take a year, you've got to slog through 10% interest. Everything's going to be 10% higher. You've got to plan on your house costing 10% more than spot, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. And the, the other thing too, Warren, in, in Australia yeah. and, and even in the world, we've seen a lot of private debt, right? And so yeah. pr pr private debt, um, a rising rate with a lot of with a high stock of private debt, even if it's floating, it'll be yeah. interesting to see how it copes with that. Well, I'll tell you what happens is Australia, I, like the US, is a net saver. Okay, the uh, domestic sector is a net saver. The government's a net payer of interest, and the domestic sector is a net saver. Well, what's your debt to GDP down there? Do you know? Sorry, I didn't hear that. The debt to GDP in Australia? Oh, somewhere around nothing. Thirties, I think. The, I think the, the net debt. It's it's practically not worth oh, the worrying the about. The government. The government. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, because here it's like a hundred percent. And so, um, and going up. And so what happens is as rates rise, the government's a net payer of interest. So it's paying interest. It's like yeah. a fiscal transfer, right? Yeah. It's, 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 it makes the deficit larger. It's a fiscal expense. And that expense, I think, tends to override the difference in the propensities to spend interest income. There has to be a difference between savers and borrowers for interest rates to make a difference. Okay, so when rates go up, for that to be a contractionary thing, it's got to hurt borrowers more than it helps savers. Yeah. But the savers, but in the private sector, for every dollar borrowed, there's a dollar saved. So it's just a transfer of income. So their their propensities to spend out of that income have to be different. The difference between borrowers and savers, they got to be yeah. a lot different because the government's throwing an additional, you know, big chunk of interest income on top of that. So even yeah. if the borrowers were hurt a little bit more, the savers are you know, 30% larger than the borrowers because of the government, because of the public debt. And, yeah. and, and when I talk to the central banks, none of them have propensities that large. It's not, it might be five or 10% at the very most. The guys at the Fed say it's close to zero. It's a little bit biased towards, you know, borrowers over savers, but not, not a lot. And so that interest- And we found income, that in Europe, didn't we, Warren? That, that yeah, yeah, rates yeah. fell and went to zero, it was, it was deflationary because people wanted to save yeah. more. Well, their, their government's spending dropped. Yeah. You know, if, if Italy's rates went from seven to zero, their spending dropped by 6% of GDP or something. Yeah. You know, that's a lot of big cut in spending, right? Yeah. And so on interest income. And it's, it's all demand side with no supply side, right? You pay more interest, you're not doing anything except adding to demand. And so, yeah, I was at, talking at, in 2012 at Rimini at a conference. And they had just, Draghi had just said, we'll do what it takes to guarantee, you know, to make sure there's no default. They said, what, the question was, what's that's going to happen? I said, well, Italian debt, the interest rates are going to come down. So that's the good news. The bad news is the economy is going to get worse because all that interest income, the economy is going to be deprived of it. Yeah. And, and nobody, took, nobody took that seriously, but, you know, it happened. And uh, it, same thing in Japan, you know, the zero rates have not shown to be inflationary or currency weakness or anything else. No. It's got nothing to do with it. You know? and, that, and that's the nature of a floating exchange rate currency. Fixed exchange rate, it's entirely different. Okay, but with foot, where the market determines rates based on the demand for reserves and everything. Oops, oh, you still there? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I think, I think, unfortunately, that's the yeah. tragedy for Europe. And again, Greek heritage yeah. here, just watching countries trapped yeah. into a mini gold standard where they need fiscal is absolutely the euro has yeah. been terrible for, for quite yeah, a, for a, pretend, a pretend gold standard. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you've got like, look, what Europe does is the, the problem is unspent income, right? It's savings, desires. If nobody spent any of their income, then the government would have to run a debt, a public uh, deficit spending of 100% of GDP just for the output to get sold so that everybody would still be employed, producing output they don't want to buy, let the public sector have it. So 
if you look at the size of the public debt, that reflects the savings desire of the population. So the highest public debt in Italy would, in Europe would be Greece and Italy. And they've got the highest savings, right, of the populations. They're the best savers. And in Europe, savings is a virtue. So the irony is they put in a policy that punishes savings. <laughs> and they're punishing Greece and Italy for being good savers. <laughs> and they're rewarding people that have ways to have, you know, private sector debt and everything else so they can grow without needing the without domestic saving and the rewarding you know rewarding them it's, it's just like it's contrary to their 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 ethics to their uh, ideology yeah. and they don't even know it you know, so it's a it's a big irony i think yeah i agree okay we might um we've got we'll probably keep going until 12 if you uh, the speakers are, are how you for time oh, i'm okay Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. So uh, we have a question now that, um, from Dallas Lewis, who's one of the, he's um, one of the co-founders of Modern Money Australia. So he's going to ask it live. Uh, this is for Con. Um, because uh, super benefits those who've done well financially in their working lives more than it does others, it's there. It's therefore, uh, in that sense, regressive. Um, and also. You know, the crit criticism of it is that it doesn't uh, provide for the real resources that will be needed by an ageing population. As somebody who works in the super industry, I'd just like your thoughts on super as a, as a retirement income system. Well, I guess you should never ask your barber for a haircut as well, right, Dallas? So, um, I, mean, I mean, so if I look at it where I grew up, my dad was, a, was 30 years as a welder. And they introduced super as part of their things in the 80s or 90s. It was with the, I think it was with Star back then before it merged with ARF and became Aussie Super. And, and back then, it was part of uh, enterprise bargaining, it was part of the industrial relations. He, he, was, a, I think he was a shop student for the, for the metal workers. And, you know, they negotiated an outcome back then to give them something post-retirement. So I think the way that was designed was for people who could work to have a universal pension and then something a bit above that. I think the way it's evolved since then is it's become more of a tax thing for those who are earning a lot more money. And I think that needs to be fixed. And that's certainly something that future policymakers will have to fix up. I think the second thing is... Um, where super has stepped in is hopefully to help uh, society on infrastructure and spending and other areas. And I think it's going to probably need to do a lot more than that. So, you know, I think Dallas, it's going to be a weak answer for me, but basically it should be, you know, you know, it should be something that's provided for people in retirement that they can use it for. And, but also that pool of savings can be used to do things and generate a return. Mm. But not used for tax. I mean, it's used aggressively for tax, and it can, you know, it should be. That's probably the biggest area that's 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 been changing recently. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Can I uh, say something here? Yeah, great. Go for it. Oh, so you know, it's in my seven deadly innocent frauds. So the sixth fraud is that we need savings to have money for investment. Right. It's actually investment that creates the savings. So that whole thing is just as backwards as everything else. And it's created all the tax advantages to have these large pools of money that have been certainly more recently creating a lot of controversy, if nothing else, and contributing a lot to uh, the uh, distribution of income issues as the Wall Street types are able to profit off of them. And they, it's a very simple method. You go around and cherry pick the brightest and best because you can pay more. And then you go to JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs and it's like kind of an unvirtuous circle the way it works. And it could be. And so what, what is, if, if you understood that you would not have tax advantages for savings, for example, you'd leave a permanent zero rate. You wouldn't allow insured funds to buy stocks because they're insured you have no risk right 
to the, the holder and um and 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 instead you just have you, you build it into what we have is social security what do you call it there your government do you have a social security government pension mm. just right, the pension. Mm. yeah the pension yeah you know be a state pension or government federal pension that wouldn't be funded you just pay it out of the general fund and yeah. it would there'd be no deductions from pay for that or anything else it would just be you'd have to have enough tax liability to you know to, to cover it but it, you wouldn't have like um deductions from your pay based on how much you know just be part of the general tax tax uh, system but anyway um and then it would be you'd have some kind of equitable living more living wage or more than living wage so you might get five thousand dollars a month or six thousand dollars a month it would be kind of universal for everybody who reached the age of 65 or 70 or whatever you know the politically you decide you want to do um and if people want to save money on the side, fine, but you don't have to have uh, funds with the real cost of, by real cost, I mean, people tied up like I was in the financial sector managing these things. I mean, I was doing that for 20 years and in a different world, I would have been out curing cancer, you know, and maybe I came up with MMT, but maybe I would have cured cancer. <laughs> <laughs> You know, which which is more valuable, yeah. you know, or, or come up with cold fusion for free energy or something, right? So uh, it's a huge brain drain. So the whole financial sector, which includes management of all the finances, is a brain drain. It's an opportunity cost, taking away, you know, the brightest and the best, really, because it pays the most uh, from doing things that maybe are more useful. And uh, look, when I started in 1970. 1972, we had 2.6 million housing starts with less than 200 million people and no financial sector. We have some savings and loans that just took in deposits and made mortgages. And then a couple of years ago, with 330 million people, we had 2 million housing starts with a financial sector that's 30 or 40 percent of the S&P 500, right? And 2 million is an unsustainable bubble. It's like, really? Yeah. <laughs> of course yeah. not. But but there's so many real resources tied up in the financial sector that it's just stifling everything else. And it all counts as GDP. So the numbers look good, but it feels bad. People are struggling. Mm. They, they don't know where it's going. They know there's a leak. They don't know where it is. And it's right there. It's not just financial. It's the whole fire, right? Financial insurance, real estate. Yeah. You know, there's no real value. I value. mean, luckily, uh, Australia doesn't have that what the U.S. has a social security fund and we worry about whether we fund it or not. That's at least it's out of the, our general good. accounts. Good, you're way always, out of Living in the States, when I lived there, I always found that a bit weird how uh, you had this sort of trust fund to social security. Yeah. It is, it is. It's, it's like a disgrace mm -hmm. that we don't understand the counting well enough to have something like that. Okay. Thanks, Dallas, and thanks. Um, we move on to, um, there's a question by Angul. I'll just find it again. I'll ask this question for you, Angul. How MMT, how does MMT avoid the role of um, parasitism characteristic of private banks, which is always, which are always absorbing the surplus of economy and in the end is causing debt deflation? Is there any proposal on that? And um, maybe Warren. Yeah. So I, I, have, I have a paper on my website. You can read it. It's only a couple of pages. It's called Proposals for the Fed, the FDIC, the Treasury Banking System. And it outlines what is generally known as what I would call narrow banking and clean sheet of paper, what you would do with the banking system. I guess I could outline it quickly for you. Would you like me to do that? Yeah, yeah, we've got 10 minutes and probably I'll try and get two more questions in before we finish. So, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> why don't we do the... <laughs> now you got me on the spot trying to... No, pull well, I mean, you go... No, we can actually shift but, all um, the questions to maybe Twitter if we don't get... Yeah, but, so just but, go but the, the important thing is you tell the banks what they can do rather than what they cannot do. Because when you tell them what they cannot do, they come up with all kinds of things and you got to figure out why they can't do them. 
and it, it should only be things that serve public purpose. So um, yes, if we think banks should make loans, if we think housing loans are a good thing, fine. They've got to be regulated. They've got to serve public purpose and that's what they can do. So they should not, so banks can loan against financial assets. You can go in with stocks and bonds and loan them. Like why should a bank do that? What public purpose does it serve? Nothing, especially in the US. That's part of where the asset price volatility comes from is that you can finance all this stuff. Uh, and so the, the paper goes through the list of what banks should be able to do, what they shouldn't be able to do. Uh, and always with a mind towards serving public purpose uh, gives recommendations on that. Okay. And well, and by the way, public, the answer isn't necessarily public banks because they have problems too. And so uh, it, it gets into that a little bit. So I'm not like, certainly not against public banks, uh, but they're dangerous animals, just like private banks are. They become highly politicized. You, yeah, we'll approve your loan if you're a member of our party, <laughs> that kind of thing. And it's, it's very difficult to get around that, just the nature of human beings. So they're, they both have to be highly regulated and supervised first before you let them do anything. Okay, and that um, paper is easy to find if, um, what's the yeah, title it, of the paper? Uh, go to MoslerEconomics.com mm -hmm. okay. and it's called, and it's proposals for the Fed, the Treasury and the FDIC. Okay, well, yeah. thanks Angul and thanks, uh, we might, um, I'll go to a live question now. We have a few people wanting to ask still. So I'll, um, Alistair Leith, I'll just unmute you and you can ask your question live. Thank you. Uh, hear me? Yep. Uh, Warren, I love uh, the simplicity and clarity of your metaphors, and I'm often referring people, particularly sort of finance and economics educated people, to your My Business Cards of Money sort of story on YouTube. It's, yeah, they yeah. seem to be the hardest people to get through to because they already know everything and a lot more than you. Um, <laughs> me, a lot more than me, not you. Um, so the Federal Treasurer of Australia said on Prime Time TV that, you know, the spending on JobKeeper, which is, you know, paying partial wages to people stood down from COVID, and JobSeeker, which is just normal unemployment, um, will take generations of Australians to pay it off, and literally our grandchildren will still be paying it off. And that yeah. was kind of greeted with knowing nods from, you know, Australia, Australia's most known TV host, not because she's sort of, sort of economist or anything like that, but because it's yeah. sort of public nonsense, um, that, you know, common, common sense, common nonsense, that this is how things are. And I'm wondering if you have a kind of a good metaphor. I, I mean, I started trying at it, but yeah. I, I couldn't really get anywhere. But the idea that yeah. we're all of a sudden living beyond our means, like overnight, yeah. we're, not, we're not eating twice as much food overnight. We're driving right, less, right. we're importing less goods. Right. Sure, there's a productivity loss, but is there a way you can kind of capture all that just so that it gets penetrates people and they have that light bulb yeah. moment that I had when I saw your business card metaphor? Well, look, the, the way I say it is the public debt are just the dollars spent by the government that haven't yet been used to pay taxes. And they sit in accounts at the Reserve Bank or in cash <laughs> until they're used to pay taxes. And those accounts at the Reserve Bank include treasury securities, bonds or notes, and cash, you know, cash balances, reserves. And so, it's, and they make up the money supply for the economy. And so when the government spends more than it taxes, it's adding to the money supply, and it just remains outstanding until it's used to pay taxes. So it's already the money, there's nothing to pay off. A treasury bond is already the money, it's dollars in an account, it's a time deposit in a, in a reserve bank. No different than a time deposit in any other bank. You don't, you don't, you know, when it comes due, they move it from your checking savings account into your checking account. But it's, it's at all times, it's already the money. So there's nothing to pay back. It's just a, uh, it's just not an applicable concept. So maybe the truth is better than a metaphor in this case. Yeah. It's, that's just yeah. direct. Yeah. And uh, I use the story of Pompeii. Have you heard me go through that? Pompeii. Yeah. No, I haven't heard that one. All right. So we'd visited Pompeii and they showed us these gold, not gold, they're just 
cheap metal, but there were coins that they'd used. And the guide said, uh, well, it was a nice place to live. They used these coins. The government would uh, collect these coins for tax, and then they would pay people to do public service. And I said, well, no, actually, they would pay the people first, and then they collect the coin. He goes, no, 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 you collect the tax, and then you pay people. I said, well, where, I said, well, where did the coins come from? He goes, the government made them. I said, well, then how did anybody get a coin to pay the tax? And he goes, no, 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 and he grabs his head and runs away, and he wouldn't talk to me for the rest of the tour. <laughs> so, but look, everybody in Pompeii knew, you know, they'd put tax, the government would pay you, and then you'd pay the tax, and they'd get the coins back. But they found 20,000 coins in the street in Pompeii. Well, how did they get there? Well, the government must have spent more than they collected, right? They People would show up for work, they'd pay them, they'd earn more than they needed to pay the tax because they wanted to have them in their pockets or in the cash register, and they wound up in, in the streets after the volcano you know, buried the place. Mm. And that is the public debt, the coins that were spent that hadn't yet been used to pay taxes, and they were the money supply in Pompeii. It's not something... Nobody said, how do you pay that back? It's just the outstanding coins. Now, they didn't have accounts to earn interest on them, so they were just in the street. But if they did, it wouldn't have changed anything. It's still you know, just the coins that were spent that hadn't been used to pay tax. So you can tell that little story maybe. I don't know. Yeah, it's a good story. Yeah. I had a second one, Jane, but there's probably people in the queue, aren't there? Yeah, we have to wind up now, but um, I reckon just take it on to – uh, if you're on Twitter, and then yeah. we can continue the conversation there. Um, I might give the final question to Con if you have anything to ask in, in closing, and then I'll hand it over to Josh to say the final farewell. So, Con, do you have anything you'd like to ask? And you're on mute. So Yes, I'm, <laughs> thank you for correcting it because I, would have, I just started. I. Yeah. Really enjoyed this, Warren. I could speak to you all day. I think we've only just scratched the surface of what we can talk about. I just want to thank uh, everyone, and particularly you, Warren, for giving your time. I notice you have your Australian T-shirt on. Good on you. Um, <laughs> and thank you for everyone for organising Jane and uh, Joshua. Um, as I said, yep, carry it on on Twitter. I think uh, I've about a million things I could ask. So thank you so much, everyone. I really enjoyed this. Best way to spend a Sunday morning, I reckon. Yeah, thank you. And um, Joshua, I'll let you um, say the final farewell. <laughs> thank you. And All thank right. you, everyone. Yes, as Jane said, thank you everyone for attending today um, and taking some time out of your day to learn a bit more about the monetary system. And again, on behalf of Monument Australia, we'd like to thank uh, Con and Warren for taking time out of their days as well to speak to us. We really appreciate it. And it's been a fascinating talk. Hopefully we'll have you both on again at some point in the future. Um, with that, I'd just like to give a little plug for our next upcoming talk, which is with uh, Dr. John Harvey from uh, Texas Christian University. He'll be talking about uh, Forex market and in a fortnight's time. And that should be a really interesting talk as well. Um, he's a great communicator as well, like Warren. Um, with that, just again, thank you to everyone. And have a lovely day. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very Thanks much. Warren. Cheers. Yep. Good Bye. to be here. Thanks. Thanks. Yep. Nice to Bye. meet you. Bye-bye. Yeah.